All right, good. Well, hello again, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Commander Desiree Frame. For those who don't know me, I'm one of the co-leads of the Eastern Region Public Affairs Mentorship Group, and I'll be moderating tonight's panel on social media literacy and ethics. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us either now or when you watch this video later. And a big thank you to Kara and Sean for our two panelists for volunteering to share their time and their knowledge with us uh, on such a very important topic. Um, for those of you who don't know, we've been doing these mentorship panels via Zoom since really about since the pandemic began uh, to try and just incite dialogue and confirmate a uh, conversation about topics that we think are relevant. And then hopefully to build some maybe new um, uh, relationships if you don't have those already or just to strengthen some that you might. So thank you for joining us for that. I, I honestly thought this topic was relevant. It's not a a new topic at all, but there's been some new uh, buzz about it, I guess, in the in the news lately. And it occurred to me a few weeks ago that this is something that I think is, there's probably some benefit in revisiting and talking about amongst this group of communicators. And so I was really excited that both Sean and Kara uh, agreed to, to talk about it because um, it can be a bit controversial. And to be honest, we may go some places where I think people might feel a bit uncomfortable or afraid to say things. This is our, our safe space. and. Um, if you don't wanna say anything tonight or you feel like you have additional comments, I'm also happy to just continue this conversation offline as well. I think there's a lot that we can do uh, to further our own personal development and then the community's professional development as well by having these hard conversations. So please feel free to let me know if you wanna take this offline. Uh, but without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Kara and Sean for those of you who don't know them. There's a bit of information about them. So I'll start with Sean. He's been in the Navy since uh, 1994. Very impressive career and history um, that he's built while he's been in the public affairs community since 2007, once he became one of the, the photo LDOs before those went away. Um, was a personal photographer for the Secretary of the Navy. Very impressive. And then a couple of his first PAO tours were actually in Chinfo, uh, initially as a director of Emerging Media in 2010. And then he left there, did some great things, came back in 2016 as the digital content strategy, uh, organizing that information. So a lot of good hands-on experience, and I'm sure we're going to gain a lot of insight. And then right now, for those who don't know, he's the, the PAO on the Dwight D. Eisenhower, his second time on the ship. And so he's running their social media channels and platforms. So I'm sure that'll all come up in our conversations. And then for Kara, uh, another Naval Academy grad, whoop, whoop, and uh, class of 2012 there. And she's also done a ton of tours in DC, a myriad of tours with experience. But I think her biggest uh, value asset she's gonna bring to this conversation, and I'm really excited to hear about, is her time at SDSU, um, where she studied the news and social media and the main thing that I'm gonna put her on the spot with a little bit later, sorry for not telling you, um, is her, um, her culminating co co project that she did. So this was on social media literacy, literacy's impact on employees and their willingness to correct misinformation and disinformation on behalf of their organization. And so uh, that's definitely somewhere I wanna to explore tonight. And I'm really looking to see what you learned there. So that's just a quick bio about them from what I found on paper. So I'll pass it over first to Sean, if you can just tell us a little bit more your personal experiences that you've had um, relevant to this topic. Yeah, I guess uh, just first off, thank you for the opportunity. And then uh, second, uh, for those that are watching the recording, uh, if you have questions, you can hit me up at sean.eklund at gmail.com or at uh, cvn69.navy.mail. I'm also on Twitter. You can direct message to me there at Eklund Range. So, uh, so yeah, just to, to kind of kick it off, um, Actually, Dave Warner, I see he's on the Zoom, uh, started social media at Chimpo while he was uh, kind of turning over the reins uh, to Mr. Madden's team. And uh, that's when we, we kind of uh, uh, created uh, or operationalized uh, social media. Prior to that, uh, Leslie Lichen, uh, she had it and she really uh, uh, blazed a path and provided us a pretty good start and a pretty good direction on getting the Navy into social media, which at the time was primarily uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, for the most part. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, the, the two and a half years that I uh, worked social media for the Navy was, uh, was incredible. I learned a lot from that. And, um, and like I mentioned to you earlier, you know, it was, uh, it was really eye-opening to kind of see the full spectrum of, of conversations that take place in that space from uh, no matter what we would post, you know, you'd have those that 25% that would just be negative comments. Uh, 
maybe another 25 to 50 percent that supported us and then um, you know, the rest that was somewhere in between um, and it, it didn't matter right it, it could be uh, the most positive uh, information positive news and we'd always have 25 percent that would just uh, no matter what they would hate on us and and for the most part this was probably before really russia and uh russia's trolling activity or their counter information operations so it was really primarily uh, Americans that, or, and, and for the most part, I can tell, veterans of, of the Navy who uh, just, I, I think uh, social media provides that avenue for if you want to be negative, uh, you, you, know, it, you have a voice where you can, you can, um, you can be negative. So that was kind of eye-opening to me. Um, I think prior to that, I would have thought, you know, would have something negative to say about it. But yeah, so I've, I've probably talked so much already. Great insight. And then, so Kara, over to you, kind of putting you on the spot too, would love to hear a little bit just about what you actually found in your research there at SDSU. And then if you have seen any benefits to it or tried to implement any of that since then. Thank you. And thank you for um, letting me come and talk today. I really appreciate it. I'm super passionate about this topic too. Um, I first became interested in media literacy and how we can, you know, kind of teach people how to access, analyze, and create uh, information for themselves and for others. After I read P.W. Singer's book, Like War, um, and he presented all these issues about misinformation and disinformation, especially on social media and how it's kind of, um, propagating and creating issues for national security. And it was really talking about that intersection between um, social media and how we approach problems in the world today, which I think is super applicable to us as public affairs officers. So um, I was lucky enough that Dr. Sweetser at uh, San Diego State let me and my group um, study the effects of media literacy. Uh, and this was overarching media literacy, not just on social, but on um, news media as well. Um, and be able to study that. And we were actually able to, to um, use a Navy sample um, with junior officers and teach them critical media literacy skills to see if it affected one, their value of media literacy, um, their critical consumption skills, and then whether or not they would be more willing to um, come to the defense of the Navy in the future as well if we were under like a misinformation or disinformation attack. So um, really, I thought it was a cool topic to study. Um, we were definitely able to increase uh, people's media literacy skills, which I think is really interesting um, that we're able to like kind of help out in that way as public affairs officers. You know, it's not just always, um, there's different facets to the job, right? And being able to educate um, sailors on what we do and how we can kind of protect ourselves against tax like that. Um, I think it's super important. Um, we were not able to find a linkage in between people's social or sorry, media literacy skills and their ability to come to the defense of a organization during a crisis. But we did find that people across the board were um, more in tune with what was actually happening, which could lead to um, them coming to the defense later on. Um, we also would Loved to, would, would love to have, to have studied um, a greater sample size. We were just focusing on junior officers. I'm really interested to see with someone later in their career, you know, with more attachment to the Navy, um, if they would be more apt to, um, you know, defend the organization as well. So a lot of interesting uncoverings there. I know I shared them with Mr. Warner earlier this year. I'm really excited about uh, everything that Chinfo is doing in the media literacy realm. Uh, I think it's gonna be really awesome for the DOD. Yeah, that, that is great. I, I'm definitely interested in that as well. And I think, you know, some of what you probably studied, we probably hear a lot about just online or when you're building a brand anywhere, when they call your, your brand ambassador, right? And so if you're able to get those people who, one, know what the truth is about your brand, and then also, like you're saying, maybe a little bit later in the career, but hopefully junior as well, when they're really invested in it, then you would kind of hope that that would naturally happen, that if they see people speaking misinformation or just outright, as Sean was saying, just, you know, hating on you, that they would kind of feel emboldened to, to speak up about it with the facts that they have. So very interesting stuff. You're hundred percent right. And even with the sailors as well, um, speaking on their own accord without um, it coming from a public relations practitioner, authenticity of that message because people are more apt to trust um, members and employees of an organization where the spokesperson research has shown that time and time again. So I'm um, just kind of an interesting way to look at it, you know, that we can have um, kind of force multipliers out there in the public affairs realm. Yeah, 
So I'm going to pass this next question I have over to you, Sean, because you kind of started to talk about the, the relevance of Russia and trolls. But how, how prevalent have you seen this, maybe at your time at Chinfo or elsewhere, how prevalent is misinformation right now um, online? And is there any platform or place where it is worse than others? Yeah, so I, I think I really started seeing it when I was at Six Fleet uh, in 2000. I got there in 2013. Uh, but it was after the uh, after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, Crimea, uh, that we really start seeing it across primarily YouTube in the comments of our YouTube page on Six Fleet. Uh, that was um, it seemed like that's where a lot of their effort was focused, uh, but also a little bit on Facebook and a little bit on Twitter. Um, but primarily, and it was kind of a surprise to me, we would post video content from uh, our operations uh, DMGs. Black Sea, and I was surprised by the the, um, the volume and the velocity of the information that they were pushing on YouTube to kind of counter our message. And, and the two thematics that they would use is one as and then the flip side of that, they would use that we were incompetent or. Um, um, you know, that, that uh, we didn't know what we were doing or we were scared or Russia was able to push us out of the Black Sea. So they would switch back and forth between those two narratives. Uh, but, but most definitely YouTube, in, in my time at Six Fleet, uh, YouTube in the comment section was uh, where they wanted to, um, to wage that counter or disinformation uh, campaign. Um, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I think I put Twitter on YouTube. Um, and again, a little bit on Facebook. What I found though is on Facebook, if you were to reply to their comment and 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 I would only do this when I had a pretty good idea that they that I was that they were Russian trolls. Um, if I were to call them out, they their accounts would either they would go mute on the account or the account would end up being deleted or uh, or, or died. So um, not so much on YouTube. I would try the same tactic on YouTube. But you would see a consistent and constant uh, back and forth with them um, on YouTube. And, and uh, also it was a, a collaborative effort. You would see multiple parties get involved. And you would also see it not just on social media. And so one of the first cases we saw was uh, Russian who announced that, I think it was the Donald Cook, uh, uh, sailors on the Donald Cook resigned their enlistment was the exact quote. Um, and he mentioned that in a in a, uh, in a press conference. Now, I don't think it was in Russia. I actually think it was in another country. I want to say somewhere in China. And uh, Phil McGuinn, who was our Stratcom guy, at Sixley, mentioned it to me. He's like, hey, you might want to look at this. And I looked at it, and I was like, this is so ridiculous. No, one, no one's going to believe this. And time and time again, they would use their reports, mostly internal Russia. You know, so it was... Uh, um, you know, Russian media reports, they would use links to that in YouTube to point back to, you know, us being weak or us being scared of the SU-24 or Russian technology or, you know, uh, you know, this is, you know, usually those uh, information campaigns were focused on making Russia look bigger and badder than, than what they are. And so, and so, yeah, so you would see that kind of counter message. And that lasted my entire tour there. And uh, Phil McGoon would, would often come to me and say, see, I told you, you should have countered it then, because now you're countering it little bit by little bit over the course of the time that I was there. So, so yeah, um, I guess my the long answer here is on YouTube. What I see now, um, just uh, on board the Ike, it's all platforms. Um, and it's harder now, I think, to distinguish between uh, foreign parties, bad actors, and actual U.S. citizens who either are misinformed or are politically motivated. And it's a lot harder, once you kind of determine whether or not they are a US citizen, it's harder to refute some of their claims because they're so politically biased that uh, you don't want to wade into that uh, discussion. Um, we saw that a lot with uh, our communications campaign around informing family members about the COVID vaccination. Um, and the thought being that we would inform the family members make sure they understood what, you know, what their sailors, some of them, you know, young sons and daughters right out of high school, inform them, give them an idea of how the Navy was taking care of protecting them, providing them this option for a vaccination. And uh, there was a large, I, I would say there was the majority 
the spoken majority uh, was very negative to to that uh, to those messages. Um, I think there was a large uh, the majority, uh, a silent majority of that, um, and I saw that in the likes and the, and the shares and the you know a majority of them appreciated what the Navy was doing, but they would not comment. So what was left was just uh, again that negative um, critical uh, view of uh, of the Navy uh, and primarily our efforts to evacuate. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I think you bring up kind of a couple of good points in that in that discussion, uh, because part of it has to do, it, it kind of goes back to where Kara was talking about just knowing the information, right? So potentially what was happening there, those family members, yeah, probably a little bit uh, politicized, but maybe just misinformed themselves. And that could have been from the bad news sources they were getting. And this kind of came out again in some of those uh, congressional hearings on Facebook just a few weeks ago. And Kara, I wonder if you can speak to this a bit more when it comes to just misinformation in news articles and the ability for those to get quickly shared and then shape people's opinions in potentially the a completely wrong way. When you were doing your studies or, or elsewhere, have you seen how, how that kind of matriculates and how it can spread so quickly? Yes, I actually saw um, a couple different, one of the things we did, um, at San Diego State was one of my teachers showed us kind of like this map on Twitter through a coding program about how quickly stories can share and then how quickly they can be shared within their own echo chambers um, and in their own like little realms over and over and over again. So I think what is so important to remember for people um, is to not just get their news from one particular source or one particular side of the aisle. It's opening your scope and being able to look at all sorts of different opinions um, and ideas that are out there and not being comfortable with the fact that you think you have your opinion, like going out and challenging it by reading these various types of information and checking for facts by lateral reading or fact checking news sources. Um, there's a couple different methods you have, how you can do that out there as well. Um, but also being able to know where to get that trusted information. Anyone can make a .com site. You have to have certain criteria to make a .gov or .edu site. So, you know, being able to go to these particular platforms and being able to pull uh, information, getting it straight from the source, actually watching a press conference um, um, from the podium, you know, instead of just reading a um, news organization's interpretation of what was discussed at that press conference. Super important way I think that people need to be taught um, on kind of like how to receive information and how to go about fact checking and getting outside their own echo chambers as well. Yeah, that, that's very important. I think we'll come back to that maybe a little bit later. Um, but I wanted to shift gears back to Sean as it kind of re relates to that. As you were doing your most recent campaign, you were talking about the vaccination for your sailors. I'm wondering when you started to see kind of these comments online, did you, or maybe you didn't, but if you did, um, or did you think about it, take that information back to your sailors? Like how did you ensure that those harmful or maybe negative comments that weren't true weren't impacting your sailor's decision back when it still was voluntary to get the vaccine? So we used a lot of uh, CDC's uh, uh, communication campaign material, uh, you know, whole cloth, like uh, we didn't change it, uh, just pull it out, put it into our internal newsletters, uh, shared it in, in emails, provide, real, worked with the senior medical officer and his team to provide that information. And, and really on an aircraft carrier, one of the most effective means is via the chief's mess, LPOs, directly to the sailors in the morning quarters, but also, you know, in posters or printed material where the sailor has the option to read it. And we positioned that content as uh, like, look, here it is. This is, these are the facts. Uh, educate yourself on it. Um, uh, we won't, you know, at the time we weren't, I would say we were pressuring in that we were providing as much information as possible. Uh, the medical team also provided, um, I, Training or classes would probably be a stretch too far, but if you wanted, if you had questions, you could go to a physician. Medical was offering that, and they would sit down and kind of discuss uh, 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 the health uh, implications of the vaccination or not getting vaccinated. Uh, we had a lot of female sailors who uh, had questions on, you know, if they if this would affect uh, you know their their uh, fertility in the future. So a lot of those concerns um, on social media we would use, again, the CDC's information uh, point blank, like oh, replying to those that were providing misinformation, like point blank. Um, I found that, uh, and, and let me, 
me kind of back up and get a larger picture. For the most part, uh, on Ike, the E5, MC, and the E6s own social media. Uh, it's not the domain of the public affairs officers, right, on board. Um, now, we work with, uh, like, we have a daily meeting where we discuss content and what we're trying to do uh, with our social channels. And I really try to push that down to the lowest level to have them own that communication, those communication channels. But when it gets to refuting or going back and forth with audience members, typically that's brought to my attention or I'll see it. And then uh, it's at my level that I'll go, you know, go back and forth. I don't want to say a tit for tat, but I um, early on, I tried not to allow misinformation or disinformation to just hang on the page without, without uh, an honest try to say, look, here, here's the fact. And I probably won't change that person's mind. But I also didn't want those that were going and looking at the comments to think that we were walking away from the truth. Uh, we allowed falsehoods to stand. Um, so there was a balance there. At some point, I, you know, I had to wave, uh, wave off because uh, I didn't want to get stuck in the mud with, uh, with the way the conversation was going. But uh, I was pretty aggressive uh, early on, especially on Facebook, in pointing out. Um, and I'll back up. I was pretty aggressive because it was the health of our sailors that was at stake, right? And I, and I think that's critically important, especially if you're an officer and you're in charge of the communication for the strike group. That's an important message to send to the moms, dads, brothers, sisters out there that we, we take this very seriously. And I didn't want to uh, allow one or two vocal critics to own the airwaves on that. So I fall back. No, that's great. That's great. And I think we'll maybe revisit that uh, conversation as well here in a bit. But I want to pass it back to Kara. Just as I was looking into this conversation for tonight, I found some statistics that I thought were kind of staggering. It said 26% of news consumers actually can't tell if an article that they're reading is real news. And so when you were doing your study with the junior officers, I wonder, did you find similar statistics? And then if so, going back to some of those kind of tips and tools that you were talking about so people can cross check, how did you make sure, or how did you guys try to teach them to distinguish the real from the fake news? I think one of the most interesting things today is um, how accessible news is on mobile devices. And if you look at Pew Research, just how much more uh, my generation, generations probably after me as well, like are reliant on their mobile devices for phones, which, or sorry, for news, which is just making it more difficult um, for people to like sit down with a publication, you know, and be able to, okay, this is an established news source, whatever magazine, whatever newspaper that I know. And, you know, they have um, journalistic integrity and editorial guidelines and whatnot. It's getting more difficult, especially like in a social media environment where it's just screenshots that could be reshared, et cetera. Um, but what we taught our um, subjects when we were studying, we used a program called Learn to Discern, which is uh, the International Research and Exchange Board. It's, um, I can, and I can send this to the link to you as well afterwards, but um, it is a week-long course um, that people, that this in International Research and Exchange Board will go and take into various countries to make sure, and I know they did a lot in the Ukraine as well, um, being able to teach people how to understand and consume news and know when they're kind of like under a misinformation attack. So we condensed as much as possible down to our one hour session that we're able to do. We know that we couldn't capture everything that they were capturing, but what we did touch on was um, this idea of naming entertainment. So whenever you're faced with a piece of information, pausing and thinking about how this message is affecting you and what kind of emotions are arising from it. If you see something that's meant to like kind of like peak your um, emotions of anger or sadness or frustration with something, really pausing and thinking, okay, like, why is this doing this to me? Is it a targeted persuasive ad? Um, and also being able to pick apart different types of media. One of the things we went over was um, the different types of media that we're presented with on an everyday basis. So we can have, you know, a straight piece of news, um, just strictly factual with no opinion or bias set into it. That can be news, but there's also persuasive pieces put out there. There's propaganda put out there. There's digital advertising that's disguised to look like it's a um, editorial piece of news, but it's not. I know I experience that when I'm flipping through airline magazines all the time. I think I just read an informative article on a city I want to visit and then realize it was a paid advertisement. Um, but being able to pick apart those different pieces of information and getting down to the okay, what are they trying to accomplish through this message? And if you're able to back it up like that, you can start to kind of unravel 
hey, what was the intent intention here with sharing this information with me? And then how should I respond to it? Should I share it? Should I really, um, you know, be propagating this piece of propaganda? Um, or, you know, if this is a digital advertisement, should I be giving people my money when I know that it is marketing it towards me and my interest as well, you know, taking the extra second and thinking about that instead of just loosely sharing it um, right away. So I think it's really important to understand like the intent behind the news. And that's kind of what we taught the people as well. And we also provided, um, you know, definitions of disinformation, misinformation. We went over a couple um, examples from recent news and then really how to kind of go and fact check, you know, being able to see how different news sites are covering the same news story. Um, we call it lateral reading, where you have multiple tabs open at the same time and you're kind of fact checking those individual things, um, looking who the spokespersons are that they're quoting in articles and kind of going through their backgrounds to see if they're actually credible enough people to be talking about this issue. Um, so all sorts of tips and pointers like that. That's great. I, I really love those. And especially that first one, I think it just, it's such a basic thing to think, how do I feel about reading something? Um, but part of the sad part, if you, you, you know, you've probably all heard it before, is that a lot of times that's what news companies want to use because it sells, because people like to just have this feeling of complete disgust for some reason about the way the world is working. And so there'll be a lot of that language in there or that tone in the article that doesn't necessarily need to be in there, but because they know it's going to sell, that's why we get these sensationalized headlines and that's why you'll see the tone throughout. Um, but that also makes me think of something we were talking about the other day and I'll pass this one back over to Sean. Um, but as we, as PAO, we're putting this content out, whether it's ourselves or our staffs, we're also, as Sean was alluding to earlier, responsible for then monitoring it, right, and responding sometimes if necessary or sometimes not, but either way, we have to organically receive all of this content back um, and all the comments, and I wonder, are we seeing or maybe have you seen either your sailors or someone else in the community who gets that and has to like kind of just pause and think like, how is this impacting me as a person, and then is there something that we should be, be doing about that, about our own like personal reactions to it? And how do you kind of distinguish between, okay, this is how I feel about these comments, but this is how Lieutenant Commander Eklund is going to respond and not, you know, Sean Eklund to these people that you might want to talk to sometimes. <laughs> sure, yeah. So I think uh, what I've been referring to from the very beginning, uh, negative stimuli bias, right? So the bias that humans have to put more emphasis on the negative. Um, uh, that's why news sells, right? It's that bias that, that uh, creates the news, uh, a negative news, and why that negative news travels further than positive news. So yeah, and looking at the comments, absolutely. I think um, I read a book, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name uh, right now, John Maxwell, Everyone Communicates, Few Connect. Uh, there's that book, and then um, The Content Trap is another really good book. But in both of those books, the con some of the thematics that overlap is that it's not about the content, it's about the connection. And so early on in, in my tour, I, I got to Ike in, in December, but even like when I was at Six Fleet, uh, I learned this more from Jason Kelly, it's, it's not about the content, it's really about making those connections. And so if you think about what your purpose is at the command that you're working at, um, you know, and what their communication objectives are, and you're trying to connect with that audience, then I think even those who may have a negative uh, opinion on what you're saying or what you're doing, um, uh, I think you, if you think about it that way, you're, you're better uh, positioned to communicate um, and not get sucked into their, their negativity. Uh, early on when I was at Chimpa, we had a, a retired chief who every time, I think on Thursdays, we would put a, uh, a historical fact on the Navy's Facebook page. And he either was associated with, and Dave Warner probably knows who I'm talking about, he was either associated with or worked with, or was just a huge fan of uh, Naval History and Heritage. And, he, and I guess he felt like we were stepping into the domain of Navy History and Heritage by putting out this you know, Naval History facts. And he would go at us every week, he would go at us. Uh, uh, what, you know, if we had the slightest error in that, uh, that fact, uh, hist historical fact, he would be all over us. And so my initial reaction was like, all right, let's just shut this guy down, right? Let's just block him or let's go toe to toe, tip, tip to tat. And someone I was working with was like, no, let's bring him in. Let's invite him to write a blog. Let's make him a contributor, right? This guy's really smart. He's passionate. He has all, you know, this is, this is one of those that we can easily flip. 
And sure enough, we invited him in and he was one of our best producers of content. He, you know, completely changed his perspective on it. So I, I try to think that way first, try to think like, Hey, um, you know, you know, not belittle them, but, uh, you know, they, they, sometimes they just don't know what they don't know. Um, and so if we're doing our best to communicate to them, uh, hopefully, uh, we can either a flip them or b at least show the majority out there that that uh, that are working uh, or are listening to what we're saying. Show them that we care and that uh, we believe in what we're saying and we're fighting for the truth. Hey, was it Paul Taylor, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't Paul Taylor. The old retired chief. Uh, I forget his name now, but he was. I don't even think he had a uh, either a Twitter handle or he had uh, his own blog or something. And, um, but anyway, that's a long time ago when we used to blog. <laughs> that's true. It has been a while. Um, I guess I want to switch it back over to Kara for a little bit as well. And so in, in light of some of these recent, I don't want to call them scandal, but recent information about how some of these social media platforms are using algorithms, which you kind of alluded to previously, to make sure that certain articles are getting more attention, maybe if they do spark those, uh, you know, feelings that we have inside of us. I, what do you think um, our role as PAOs should be in addressing these platforms? Is there something that we should be doing? Is there a different way that we should maybe be putting content out? Or is there even room for us to explore the option of, hey, you know what, how you're running your platform isn't in line with Navy ideals. Um, and so we want to take away, take a step away from this platform. What do you think about that? I think as long as our audiences are still on social media, um, then there's still a need for us to be on there. Um, so I really think, you know, just learning how to operate um, you know, you can't live with it, can't live without a kind of mindset where, you know, we really just need to be smart on how we're engaging with the platform and pushing content out and needs to be as credit. And I think we do a great job about this as credible as possible, you know, not, never losing that credibility. If we make a mistake, being quick to own it. Um, but also we have that responsibility to educate our own internal sailors who are engaging with the platform as well. Um, but if we're trying to reach people and still speak to them, social media is still a wonderful way to do it because, um, you know, what mass communications through the mass media is great, but eliminating that gatekeeper and talking directly to our audience is also super important. And I don't think we'd ever want, really want to lose that. We just need to be able to do it in a responsible manner um, and just trying to be as credible as possible. No, that's great. I'm going to ask you, Sean, the same thing. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think Kara just like nailed it. I, that was uh, <laughs> probably the, the most succinct. Uh, well thought out and intelligent comment. I can't beat that. Like, uh, absolutely. Like credibility, I think is number one. Anything that we do um, to try to get out of our echo chamber and or be more social or more cool or more, you know, more hip, whatever, um, in, in spite of our credibility is the wrong answer, right? That's, that should come first. Um, but yeah, I refer to Kara because she just knew that time. <laughs> Okay, well, then I'm not going to let you escape so easily. I'm going to get back to something you brought up earlier. You're talking about kind of at Six Fleet, and you were there, and you're seeing these comments on YouTube, and you see misinformation, you're trying to address it. Maybe that experience is a little bit different because you're at more of a senior echelon command, but in general, or maybe there, how, how available do you think, or how much access do you think we as PAOs have at the more tactical level to really respond to these types of comments when we see them, and do you feel like we have enough? power there or is the chop chain maybe a little bit too slow uh, what, what are your thoughts so uh complete honesty here at six fleets no one was paying attention to social media so um i felt like i had uh you know i was able to move at the speed of social so if i saw comments on, on i'm gonna go back to youtube if i saw comments on youtube i would speak as the as the six fleet uh, spokesman on that channel and refute or try to counter or try to provide attack the source so call them out call them so, you know, Russian trolls um, provide factual information either press release press releases links to press releases or other news sources to you know to kind of show again that silent majority that one we're not going to back down and two like, this, is, this is what actually happened um, times have may have changed um, 
I think though, if you have the trust of your leadership, uh, they're not going to, you know, they'll, they'll look at your posts. They'll, you know, my CEO daily looks at our Facebook, Twitter posts, but he doesn't go and dig down into the comments. Um, and if he did, uh, that's fine. Right. Like I'm, I, I, I stand behind everything that we've said on there. Um, so, yeah, so I think at six fleet primarily, no one was paying attention. Admiral Ferguson came in at the last part of uh, my tour there. And uh, he wanted, the question he asked me was like, Sean, I got it. You spent a lot of time countering Russia, Russia's propaganda. But what does winning look like? <laughs> and I, like that broke me because <laughs> I didn't have a good response. Like, I don't know what winning looks like. I don't know if you can win. I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if that's, if the role is to win. Um, I think the role is, again, maintaining our credibility, uh, treat, uh, speak truth to falsehood, speak truth to power, um, and to uh, best represent our actions. And speaking of that, that was another opportunity that I had at Succeed where like, uh, we were actually able to, at the time, change the way that we were operating um, and then communicate, communicating about our operations to send a signal to Russia. And that was really neat. That was really like it was more than just, hey, bring the PAO in after the fact. We bring the PAOs in before, and let's 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 determine how we're going to operate in the Black Sea or in the Baltic Sea to have a, a strategic communication effect. And that was really neat. Um, Adam Cole did an amazing job at that. Uh, Linda Rojas, she's now retired, so like they were the ones that kind of like pushed us in that direction. It was really cool to see. Yeah, it's, it's always great when you can align your actions with your words and then be like, now see what you could say about that. Not a darn thing, right? <laughs> um, yeah, well, no, just I real quick, I got a, a quick, funny uh, little story on that. So in one of the meetings, we were discussing uh, passing exercises. It's a classic, like what, it, what two navies do up the sea, right? And I made the comment to the senior uh, planner there that, you know, a passex is very passive in its name. It sounds passive. It sounds like we're not doing it. And I recommend that we change it to a NATO underway engagement um, exercise or operation. He laughed me out of the room. He was like, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous, ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And not two days later, we're briefing the Admiral and the Admiral looked, turned and said, is there another name we can give this exercise? <laughs> and so I wasn't in the room, but I heard it from some of my other junior officers like stormed into the PA office and like, you'll never believe this, but you got your wish. The Admiral wants to change the name too. So it was, it was pretty, it was like, it was a good moment for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to love it. <laughs> oh man. Well, I'm going to shift gears a little bit before I turn it over to some of our people on the call, because I do want everyone to be able to ask some questions. And, and Kara, take, it, take us from our professional where we've kind of been focusing to our personal. A lot of us as professional communicators also do things outside of the Navy, maybe, or we have our own personal presence online, how do we kind of ensure that we're not, you know, perpetuating this information or keeping the lines clear while we're, you know, presenting our online personas? I think like I just talked about that credibility, it really boils back down to that and not putting anything out there that could possibly compromise your credibility as a United States Navy spokesperson um, and not giving our adversaries or anybody else any room to like play with on that one. Um, I really think that, you know, when we're working with our personal social media accounts, um, I try and keep any of my work related stuff on LinkedIn. Um, if I'm talking about anything professional there, my Instagram is personal. I watch my <laughs> contacts very closely and who I'm actually connected with making sure it's people I trust. Um, but we do have people, you know, in the community and in the Navy at large who um, kind of have enough followings to be considered influencers, you know, and I think, um, Public affairs officers in particular are under a little bit of a different set of standards, but I do think that there's a standard for all service members when we're representing ourselves on our personal social media accounts that um, making sure we're not doing anything that could possibly bring discredit or hurt our credibility as spokespersons as well, because it's that same name and that same rank that's going to be back out there in the news media, possibly refuting something that someone said um, about the Navy, and we need to make sure that our name is as credible as possible that we're able to back those words up because it is a positional authority that we have as spokespersons, but that personal uh, credibility, I think also comes into play with it as well. Yeah, I agree. Some great thoughts there. Um, before I open it up, Sean, did you have any thoughts on, on that topic or did Kara hit it out of the park again? <laughs> I was just gonna say, please don't make me follow Kara again on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfectly said. 
<laughs> well, I'll pause with some of my questions for a minute and see if anyone on the crowd wants to either chat something in or unmute themselves and ask a question. Hey, it's uh, it's Dave Warner. Just want to say thanks for setting this up. It's uh, really important and something obviously near and dear to my heart. We're, we're doing a lot of work up here too. And uh, Commander Hanley already knows I've already picked her brain a couple of times and kind of little silent on the net only because we're uh, waiting the next step of uh, what we're trying to work at the Chinfo side. Same with the uh, Sean. So it's not a, it's not a one day deal. It's something that's uh, been going on for more than a decade now. Uh, as we build into this. I do want to offer a couple things from Chinfo so you can kind of see what the picture is from the five-sided puzzle palace on some related issues uh, that touch directly into this. And, and uh, for the people, the, the people on the call are smarter than me on this and certainly more current, but other folks uh, chime, uh, who watch the recording later, so they're aware. Uh, one, there is a, D, a draft DOD instruction on social media. Uh, we waded into the middle of that and I will tell you that it's official use of social media, DOD 5400, and it put a chill into the use of social media. It was designed to get people, political appointees, some other folks off of social media, and it didn't care about the opportunity cost uh, and a lot, of those, uh, uh, a lot of those other aspects. It's official use of DOD social media, what we do as public affairs, what leaders use, uh, but as part of that, they originally had a chapter on personal unofficial use, which was a lot more than they needed. It directly conflicted with the official use. It was all, it was a soup sandwich, in my opinion. So that said, to DOD's credit, even though they really didn't staff it very well, they were receptive to us going through word by word and wicking it down. There is an appetite to get that out. And at, with the gas pedal mashed to the floor, it'll be at least a year before that thing gets out. We don't know what it's gonna look like, but that will be important. We did wick down the personal use piece to the extent that we could uh, and, and recommend that they do a separate piece on that because that gets to this question. You know, What obligation do service members using government equipment in a deployed status have for not perpetuating Russian RT Sputnik propaganda? Uh, and then likewise for public affairs officers. How do you manage personal sailor responses where it is knowingly misinformation? It might be blended into a certain political party's expedient approach. There are, it's just a minefield from a policy standpoint. It's taking a lot of brain cells to try to figure that out. The natural tendency for government is inertia. We'll just lie flat since we can't tackle the problem and kind of maneuver around it. That's why there is no social media policy at DOD, but we are getting there. So that's one big piece. Uh, next big piece uh, for, and I know the people on the call already know this, but there is media literacy, uh, not, not CARES uh, media literacy, but social media literacy really, uh, training on JKO, it's called Influence Awareness. It was actually funded out of J39. Uh, it's actually very good training. It was, it was contracted. It's about an hour and a half, and that's with a good connection, and that's if you just stream through it. But it is graduate level, in my opinion, way too rich, way too long, way too much for your typical 18-year-old 18 18 -year sailor on a ship. But for public affairs and for folks that are really interested in this topic, it's important to know that. Only, uh, as of last month, only about 2,000 people DOD-wide have looked at it in the last two or three years. I guarantee you they spent a couple million dollars putting it together. It's good training, and they've also uh, have or are updating it. So uh, influence awareness, uh, worth, worth time looking at from a DOD perspective. Uh, the Admiral has made it clear that we are going to lead the fight, right? So we talk about professionalization, we talk about alignment and leading the fight. Media literacy and the means by which we help the public narrative in this competition phase of the strategic competition, how we help deal with, with media literacy is something that we have tentative agreement from the N1 organization for FY23 to do general military training, to make it a requirement for sailors. Now, they, they 
uh, the 3-9 folks tried to push that from the joint force on the joint level to make it require training for all the services, it failed. It is not required training. That's why there's only 2,000 people that have completed that training. Uh, from the Navy standpoint, uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday, we were supposed to, uh, I was going to brief the 06 and uh, uh, senior N1 folks to uh, to uh, try to get it onto one of the four or five required training Navy-wide for 350 a thousand sailors for 23. That meeting has been pushed for a second time sometime soon, but we are, I would say we're optimistic that we are going to get that and, uh, and lead that training. So I don't know when that meeting is going to happen. After we get through that first level, it would then go up to the flag and SES level, probably three-star level for the CNP himself to decide what handful of trainings will be required for, GM, uh, for uh, GMT for sailors for 23. And the Admiral will make, Admiral Brown will make that pitch to the senior flags. So uh, we're hoping that that happens in the next month or two. Uh, in the meantime, some of the stuff that we've already pulled together from Sean's work, from uh, uh, Commander Hanley's work, is kind of sitting there. Because if it does get accepted, we're going to have to go through the whole NETC training objectives. So we don't want to get too far in front of our skis. But we got more there than, than we can pack into one training session. That all said, one thing I am positive of is it's going to be a two-phase process. One, we're going to train the trainers. So public affairs officers, MCs, uniformed, and civilians are going to lead this training uh, in fleet concentration areas at units, and it's probably going to be more than a PowerPoint because it requires too much rich understanding and discussion. Uh, you know, it's not just about how it makes you feel. It is you took an oath to support the Constitution if you have feelings that have been shaped based on your what your family is saying, what your what your bubble, what your sphere is saying, you need to really think critically about your worldview and how it comes, how your worldview has come to pass. So uh, that's going to require some detailed training, and uh, we'll see where that develops. But that's uh, that's one of the things that we're doing. A couple of other things we're looking at. If uh, any of you know Stephen Brill, once Stephen Brill's. Uh, uh, Brill's Content Magazine, uh, big media ombudsman critic guy. Uh, they have launched a new media screening tool. 643 sites are responsible for 95% of the content that is shared on social media. They've gone through and basically done up check, down check if the, the source is a reliable source. Russian, Russian uh, TV, RT, down. Sputnik, down. CNN, middle you know so they they rate all these and that uh, they are willing to work with us uh so we're, we're kind of kicking those tires right now of course we've got cyber and all the you know network common all those guys to work through but that's one more physical means where maybe we can start to help the consumer on our sites understand uh, this information that's fraught with peril so it's down the road but it's it's something else uh technical uh Okay, uh, going down one or two other things. I just want to make sure I hit them for the folks that, that come on here. Uh, one of the other things we've done recently, last week, some of you may have seen, we got a bunch of 1035s in a room uh, to do competencies. And, th and these competencies, when we did them 10 years ago, it actually informed the military uh, communicators competency model that now informs at the junior, intermediate, and senior level officer and enlisted training for public affairs. There's nothing on the civilian side. So we went back through it and said, okay, we're going to look at it again. And now we're going to go back to DENFOS and probably on the Navy side too, build out our own curriculum with courses. And I was writing down, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the books you guys are talking about and uh, learn to discern and some of the other things so we can build that in separately. Uh, but that competency model from 10 years ago, we made two changes to it, two major changes, two additions. One is crisis communication that requires its own task, skills, abilities. Uh, but the second is we broke media distribution and management, content distribution and management out because the way that we now share information and make it available on a number of platforms through different memes, medium, you know, you name it, and then manage the response and understand what's happening to it deserves a whole, uh, a competency in and of itself. Before it was kind of wedged under the well. If you do a, if you do a video, you just kind of you watch it. It's like nope, nope. This is 
uh, particularly social media administrators. So there's a lot of work that's going into that. And that will be one of the 11 competencies that 1035s uh, will train to and uh, be hired into. So uh, on the uh, media literacy, it's also important that we took it to Paytech uh, and said, hey, look, the Navy wants to do this. What is, Den I'm sorry, Paytech is the Public Affairs Training and Education Committee or the services. We said the Navy's all in on this should, and we train, a, what do we train at Denfos for public affairs? It's, they've got Karen Nauman, who's a contractor. She is APR plus M. She gives a very good uh, disinformation. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but in any case, it's a, it's a media literacy light brief. That's about one to four hours. And it's woven into some like, you know, PAX-Q and some of the, some of the capstone exercises, but it's not, not a lot. It really isn't a lot. Um, so in any case, we brought to him saying, hey, we need to, from a strategic standpoint, DENFOS, how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to instruct PAOs who are leading this fight across all the services? Basically, it was voted down saying we don't have enough to do regular public affairs stuff. So over to the services. Now, that said, the Paytech and the, the folks that we work with, Marine Corps is doing the same thing as us. They've already got their draft power uh, uh, training. It's going to be led by their ComStrat public affairs folks. Uh, we're doing ours. The Army has already introduced it and had it signed out in the field manual that public affairs will do media literacy. So they're working on their piece. Air Force has a broader, slower, more expensive, I'm sure, approach to all things uh, media literacy and, and social media. And the Coast Guard is just going to do whatever we do. Uh, they're going to steal it and put their own logo on it, which is fine by me. Um, so that's uh, that's good in that respect So and hopeful. And we've got a working group on the side. So as we develop our product, we're checking with the Marines, particularly who are uh, who are probably a little further out in front of everybody. So uh, the last piece, and this is kind of important because it really does transcend the Navy, particularly as this, uh, you know, we know about the Russian campaign, so discord, a lot of stuff is seeping in domestically. So there are US government agencies, not just the Department of Defense and the Navy, uh, but other agencies who are looking at some of these tidal trends and looking at known areas, largely overseas. Uh, when you talk U.S. government and monitoring, there are very bright, clear air gaps between what the government can monitor here domestically and abroad. So they're being very careful, but we're also seeing from and learning from a government perspective what, let's say, Russia is doing with mis and disinformation and learning their ways and understanding it. And that's uh, I would say matriculating down to the services and making us a little smarter. So that's uh, there's there's a lot more on the classified side for that, but that is also happening. And I will be honest, I am while I really want to go after them full throttle. I very much appreciate and respect that some of our government partners are respecting the laws and the, the things we have in place for our democracy. So living that standard. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Gonna be, they they got to strike the right balance and it's a really promising development. So those are some of the things that Chenfo were kind of got our toes in the water. We're trying to move it forward. And I'll tell you from you guys out there doing it and studying it at SDSU and keeping your head in the game and seeing it firsthand, what we're seeing from our sailors is just going to make us smarter. There is, there is no finish line on this effort. It is going to be a sprint and I, we haven't even gotten to the starting line, but we're going to rely on PAOs like you guys to, to help us get there and keep sailors safe and their families. So thanks. And I'll get off the net. Now that was awesome. Thank you so much. It gives me a lot of optimism for the future. I just know that those things are in the works right now. And I'm assuming, I don't know if you could speak to this, that we might also see some of this conversation or some other panels at the symposium when we have that next year. Uh, yes, I have to be, I'm sensitive to not turn, and, and Sean knows this, I'm sensitive not turning the worldwide into the OI8, you know, three-day symposium. There's so much to share that you never hear about, but uh, the Admiral is very passionate about this, uh, and we will definitely have some things to showcase. So whether we do that at a booth outside the conference where people can learn more about it and have that discussion, whether it's a dedicated brief, part of a, broad, we'll see where it is. Honestly, we're still trying to secure in a COVID environment our venue in Norfolk, uh, but I'm, I'm confident we'll talk a lot more about it. 
Awesome. That, that's very good to hear. Uh, all right. Well, we're just about at the end of our time. So I just want to pass it back over to our panelists to see if they have any closing remarks for the group. So over to you, Sean. Uh, thank you for allowing me to start because I didn't want to follow Carol. Uh, no, just um, I want to just uh, thank everybody for joining uh, this uh, the video and that um, and those watching it, like I said, uh, you can hit me up if you have any questions. Uh, I don't have too much more to add uh, other than um, I, I would just, I, we mentioned this uh, yesterday when I was, or two days ago when we were chatting, social media, when you're managing those channels can be mentally uh, uh, stressful. And so mental health uh, for those that you're either tasking to like keep a, keep a, a pulse on those channels or you yourself, like do the buddy checks, right? Like um, make sure that those comments aren't affecting you uh, personally, because uh, it is, uh, you know, when I worked at Chimpo, it was, it was one of the greatest jobs I've ever had. I loved it, uh, but it was emotionally, uh, mentally draining. <laughs> when I walked away from that job, I took a big sigh and, and really had to like self-reflect and figure out like what I just went through. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, it, it'll wear on you if you let it um, for those who uh, manage social media all the time. So that's all I have. Thank you, Kara. Thank you again for having me. Um, I actually have a Google Doc um, of a bunch of resources I can send you or if anyone wants to email me, um, Kara Yingling, my maiden name, Y-I-N-G-L-I-N-G at gmail.com. I can send it to you there through Google Drive. Um, you know, I sent to Sean and, and I think Mr. Warner too. So um, it's been around, I try and keep it updated. So thanks. That's awesome. Please do share it with me and I will make sure after all these great comments, I really appreciated your guys' time again tonight. Uh, to share your experiences, your, your research with us. And I'm going to do my best to try to summarize it a little bit. And, and then obviously the, the video will be available for everyone on YouTube. And hopefully we'll get a lot of continue the great discussion there. Um, and we'll see the, the good and the bad, I suppose. Um, but thank you again for your time tonight. And I hope you guys have a, a good rest of your evening. Bye.